Well, hello and welcome back. Whilst Peter Campbell takes a little bit of a break, I am now going to be moderating the next session. My name is Amanda Stretton, and I'm going to be talking to Patrick Ayed, the Global Leader of Mobility and Transport from Hogel Lovells, um, a global international law firm. Uh, Patrick is Global Leading Practitioner on International Contract Drafting, Procurement and Disruption, so I think very well placed to talk to us today all about living mobility. Um, we're going to be looking at how our vehicles are are evolving, what's happening to the mobility networks, and of course, how all of this is going to be changing the world in which we live. So Patrick, welcome to you. Thank you, Amanda. Hello. First of all, just explain, what is living mobility? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, and of course, uh, I, I need to explain it. Uh, that's That's obvious. Um, living mobility is probably a shift of our mindset in, in how we look at the future of mobility. And um, we've prepared uh, two slides just at the very beginning to maybe illustrate this a little bit. Um, if we think about the future of mobility, um, particularly in the last couple of years, um, someone um, you know, came up with this idea of ACES or CASE. I mean, Daimler calls it CASE for, for many years now. Uh, others call it ACES, which stands for uh, Autonomous uh, uh, connected electric and shared vehicles. And, and that was a business concept that was developed, uh, as I said, uh, quite uh, a few years ago, and which is still a sort of you know, general direction uh, the industry is heading to. Um, there are discussions now with the, with the S, the shared. Uh, some started to call it smart uh, cities and not shared um, mobility or smart mobility. Others now uh, call it uh, system integration, simply also because this concept of shared mobility is maybe something we are currently struggling with, also in light of uh, COVID, of course, the global pandemic. But I think it's still um, the general direction of the, of the industry when it comes to the business um, in, in the future, the future of mobility. You can now add uh, particularly also AI and put more focus on AI, sensors, data, connectivity, and then you have these like these new topics or new topics, but topics that you hear a lot about uh, smart mobility. Uh, I think there is a clear a trend towards convergence of um, all transport modalities. So drones, think of drones, think of trains and everything. It all comes together. Uh, Micro mobility, of course, that evolves. Um, and then it's about, you know, moving people and goods. And that is still the right direction uh, from, a, from a business perspective in particular. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, what we basically thought about is how could we maybe approach this a bit differently and just, just the perspective and, and go uh, see that more from a, from a customer perspective. And you can call it people first, but it's really the, the customer perspective. So we said, you know, living mobility for us uh, are four buckets. Uh, it's uh, objective, it's inclusive, it's unifying and it's sustainable. And um, I hope today we'll have a chance to maybe discuss all of these uh, four buckets and uh, so that we explain a little bit better uh, what we mean by living mobility. So what, how did you come up with this sort of bucket idea and why would a lawyer necessarily deal with this? <laughs> yeah, these, these are good questions. Um, uh, first question, maybe, um, you know, I, I attended CES in Las Vegas uh, earlier this year when the world, uh, at least out, outside China, was still uh, normal. Um, and uh, it was, uh, again, pretty fascinating how the traditional automotive players presented themselves at CES. I mean, this is, this is basically has become also an automotive, a huge automotive show. And some, some of the uh, traditional players, they didn't even have a car at their booth. I mean, they had some futuristic vehicles, but not a car. And I'll just use one example. Um, Toyota, they introduced the idea of a woven city. Uh, why woven? Uh, I don't know if uh, you know, um, Toyota originally was a manufacturer of, of looms. So they were in the looming business. And so they thought they would have to call it woven city. Basically, it's a sort of connected or smart city. Um, that they are trying to create there at the Mount Fuji, uh, at their Toyota area, where they create a city where people naturally, of course, move, uh, but also, you know, where they live, basically. Um, research people, but also, you know, uh, ordinary people who have nothing to do with this idea. And it is, of course, all about, you know, moving people around in this city with micromobility, with autonomous shuttle services and the like. 
but also how they live. Um, and it goes also, you can see pictures from their apartments. There are robots there that, that also help them in, in their households. Um, and so it, it just showed that, um, and I strongly believe that the, the, the way we move is very closely connected um, with uh, how we live. And it all comes together. Uh, I mean, if we sit in an autonomous vehicle, the big question is, what do we do? Uh, we live, uh, we work, we watch a movie, we make a call or something. Um, so, so this is why this brings this together. And um, we basically then called it uh, living mobility when we reflected upon what we saw at, at CES. And um, yeah, why would we deal with this as a law firm? I mean, uh, it's, it's fun. Uh, maybe that's the, the, the first part um, of the answer. The other is simply, you know, whenever you have these, these disruption, this disruption and innovation, um, regulation comes next and we need regulation also to enable to uh, shape the future. And we want to be on top of things here as well. We think that we need to uh, be uh, together with all stakeholders here to influence and shape the future of mobility, um, particularly also with a, with a global regulatory framework. And this is simply why, um, you know, apart from the fact that we need to understand the business also in the future. Okay, so the first bucket, um, objective, just give us an example on that. Yeah, I think it's best described if you look at the um, traditional bucket autonomous. So uh, there are a lot of discussions about the ethical rules for autonomous vehicles. Now, personally, I think we are not there yet uh, because, um, you know, there are other concerns than at the moment, at least for uh, engineers, then to distinguish between, let me give a very simple example between a cat and a dog and then take a decision here. But obviously, and, and that's the point from a customer perspective, this seems to be an important point. Um, so there is a lot of discussion about that. So we need to form an objective view on, on how we solve these uh, potentially ethical issues that arise uh, so that people get the trust in the technology. And this is important why we uh, look at it objectively. We can't um, have the engineers make the decision. And in fact, they would not want to do this. They do, would not want to take the responsibility. So government also needs to be involved. Um, engineers need to be involved uh, uh, to, to solve this issue. Um, another important point is transparency. We need to make the technology transparent um, to the customers. So to the same example, um, there may be someone who prefers cats over dogs. Now, you may want to tell that person that the car would take a decision in favor of the cat and not the dog, and then this person would not purchase uh, the vehicle. This is a silly example, right? But it just shows that um, customer transparency is also key. It's also key if you think about the data uh, that we are collecting currently in, in these vehicles and connected vehicles. Um, transparency is very important uh, for customers to accept um, the technology. So in uh, this modern time of diversity and inclusion, uh, inclusive seems to be an obvious one, but just tell us more about what that actually means in the automotive and mobility world. Yeah, I think one buzzword here is accessibility. Accessibility to the new modes of transport. I mean, there are a couple of examples. It's the accessibility in terms of the physical access, but also the costs, for example. Um, and again, it goes back to the consumer acceptance. Um, everyone talks, for example, about smart cities and autonomous shuttle services. But I mean, if you look at the US, what about rural areas where you also need some solutions here? So we should think about that. Um, uh, a big issue at the moment for connectivity is 5G. We need this technology basically everywhere. Um, an autonomous vehicle cannot be in a remote area and simply stop because it loses connectivity if it uses the connectivity to be autonomous. That's another question. So um, a third example, maybe drones delivery. I mean, it, it'll be amazing. And it, this is real. I mean, it, we are working on this, um, and not we personally, but the world is working on this, on drones delivery. So you order something and you'll get it basically in an hour or so by, by a drone's delivery. But it needs to be accessible and affordable, of course, for the people. Otherwise, uh, it will not be accepted. And so this is, again, um, the, 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 the shift in the mindset on, on how we see things. And just explain then what the difference is to unifying, because isn't it very similar? Uh, it is in a way uh, similar. Um, that's, that's true. Um, but it, it, it goes hand in hand. I mean, um, there is a, a certain overlap, but to me, the most important thing about um, unifying is that we bring 
all stakeholders together to um, and which is also why you know we as lawyers think uh, we should be in the mix uh, together with the other relevant stakeholders i think um, we need a holistic approach when we think about the future of mobility i also truly believe that um, we need to break uh, through these silos um, there are reasons why things happened in the industry and i'm not mentioning now the emissions issues but of course, um, uh, I think one of the interim CEOs by one of the car manufacturers also said silos are uh, our death. And I, I, I truly believe in that. So we need to break through these silos. It's currently happening. I mean, we can see a lot of collaboration going on at the moment between uh, uh, public and private sectors. That is important if you introduce new mobility solutions, if you introduce autonomous vehicle shuttle services, but also take uh, micro mobility. Um, micro mobility. I, I was totally fascinated also in Europe uh, um, when, uh, of course, companies started to introduce uh, this technology, uh, e-scooters in the various cities. And basically, even in Europe, there are no harmonized rules. There are no global uh, standards uh, or, or rules, uh, not even in Europe, regarding this technology. So do you need to wear a helmet? Uh, do you drive uh, with it on, a, uh, on the car or on the pavement? Um, it's, it's totally confusing. I remember when I started to use uh, this um, e-scooters, I was traveling and I was in, in, in Paris and in Berlin and London within, I think, three or four days. And it, it was really not clear to me what the rules were. And this is, again, totally confusing for, for the consumer or for the customer. And so we need to have uh, also here a global solution that we have, for example, for vehicles. We have global standards for vehicles and the safety of the vehicles and how they should be manufactured. We need this also for the new um, uh, modes of transport, including micromobility. There is um, SAE, which, which is an organization that is trying to standardize. So they also came up with the levels of autonomy, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And they also, um, a couple of months ago or earlier this year, introduced uh, standards uh, for micromobility. Uh, and it was at this stage just a categorization of these different types of micromobility. So what is an e-scooter and, and, and all the other things? I think that's an important and good start, but we need to you know, uh, do more uh, in, in this area uh, to allow this. Um, I, I give you, if I may, another example when we talk about autonomous vehicle technology. Um, when I was at CES earlier this year, uh, the, the transport, um, uh, the Department for Transport in the US, they were introducing this uh, automated vehicles uh, 4.0 uh, booklet, which I have here. And I, I don't know if you can see it, but it says uh, ensuring American leadership in autom automated uh, vehicle technologies. Now, to be fair, it's not just the US uh, that is uh, claiming to take the lead. It's also in Germany. Um, I, I am in Germany. So there was the outer Gipfel uh, where you know, the government meets with the, uh, the big players in the industry. And so they discuss the, the issues in the industry, which is important. I think it's a very important uh, gathering, of course. And here also then, when you read the press release, um, the, one of the conclusions was that Germany would take the lead on autonomous vehicles and would be the first to introduce it. Now, guess what? The French, they say exactly the same. They are currently working on uh, the the law, the law oriental uh, law on orientation mobility or something, uh, which would also allow autonomous vehicle technology in France. And of course, the UK uh, is also claiming to take the lead. Does this make sense? I don't know. Maybe from a political government perspective, it does. Do people care? I'm not so sure. Um, to me, it's more important that we really work together on this that we bring all stakeholders, uh, stakeholders together, as I said, uh, the industry, the engineers, the politicians, uh, policymakers, advisors, uh, even lawyers, um, to shape the future of mobility and think about um, how we globally introduce uh, autonomous vehicles. Of course, there are differences. I mean, if you ask me whether we will have autonomous vehicles uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the cities of, of Hanoi, or um, you know some other very busy cities. I mean that that will take time, right? Um, but still, we need a, a global approach, and and there are uh, certainly also attempts to do that. Um, there is on the UN level, there there are working parties who try to find global standards and global rules for that, and this is the way we need to take. Just picking up on that, how likely do you think that is going to be to happen? Because one of the sort of interesting themes that I think comes out of conferences like this is people's different, differing opinions on whether it's push 
to change or pull to change. So whether it's um, people wanting no. to make the change or whether it's done through legislation. So surely with all this sort of inter squabbling, it actually just undermines confidence. So how therefore does one go about ensuring this standardization and sort of global coherency? Yeah, you, you make an excellent point, Amanda. And, and actually, we have a slide uh, where we also use this push and pull analysis um, in the context of ACES. And uh, clearly, uh, if you, uh, and it's true, I mean, if you look at autonomous vehicles, it's not really a pull from the consumers at this stage that they would really want this technology. Uh, it's an excellent point. It's rather that uh, a push from, from the industry who, want to be, who wants to be very innovative and introduce this technology. But now also in light of COVID, th they are certainly also struggling in terms of the investments because there are a lot of investments have to go there into this technology. And so uh, they now also think about, you know, how far should we push it now, this technology, particularly maybe if the consumers are not really desperately requesting it. And I think this is very important. Um, and, and this will certainly also uh, tell us uh, how um, things will move on. Clearly, if you look at sustainable, which would be the next topic here, uh, this is a, also a clear pull um, uh, from government, but also from you know the next generation. If you think about climate change and Friday for Fu Fridays for Future, there you you have something where the industry has no other choice than than to follow. Okay, so let's talk about sustainable then. I guess you're really talking about electrification. It's uh, certainly a focus area, uh, clearly. And, uh, you know, uh, if there is one industry uh, that worked on sustainability in the last uh, five years in particular, then it's the automotive industry with the emissions issues. Um, the shift to electric vehicles is there, uh, but there are certainly new challenges. And uh, just recently, uh, we've seen reports in the press about, uh, you know, um, uh, hy hybrid, uh, uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles electric vehicles and uh, also their um, uh, you know, technology and how it works and whether they are really uh, emissions friendly or environmental friendly. Uh, because of course, the, the interplay between the ICE, the internal combustion engine, and then this electric vehicle technology is very complex. And so, um, you know, the industry needs to think about that. There are new challenges, investigators and, and uh, um, market surveillance authorities are currently looking into this and questioning them whether um, it's, it's really working in the way that it should. Um, and then if you think about battery technology, I mean, everyone knows by now, it's not just the driving, you need to produce these batteries, you need to um, get rid of these batteries, dispose them. I think we should uh, think more about recycling, which is anyway a big issue in the automotive industry anyway, and the regulators will follow. So we will see a lot of uh, um, a, a new regulation also on battery technology. Um, but um, maybe also, um, it's not just um, environmental protection. Uh, let's not forget that. Um, sustainability is also the economic and social development. Uh, you know, and just one example, supply chain. So how do we treat um, the supply chain uh, down, downwards? How do we treat our suppliers uh, in Africa, for example? Where, where do we get the raw materials and resources and whatsoever? Um, Governments are looking into this. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives on a global level, uh, UN level, but also, let's say, for example, in Europe, uh, we have the Green Deal initiative, for example. Um, and it's not just about environmental protection. It's also about how we basically behave, again, as, as humans, uh, which brings us back to this uh, perspective, you know, um, looking at it from a more customer and, and maybe consumer or human perspective when we think about the future of mobility. Right, we've got very little time left, so I'm going to jump to some questions. Um, just very quickly, shifting to autonomous cars, what's your view on who is going to be liable in the case of an accident? That's uh, yeah, that will, yeah that, that, that's, that's a, 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 of course, a standard question here. Um, uh, there will clearly be a shift uh, to the manufacturer of the system. Uh, I think everyone knows that. Uh, you know, once you take the driver out of uh, the, the, the mix, um, uh, clearly, it's the it's the one who developed the system, or even the one who operates the system, and or it could be both. Um, there is one thing which I wanted to add here is it's about L three, um, the the level three, which causes these issues between um, uh, with the interaction between the human and the machine. I struggle with that. I even think that maybe we should um, skip L three and go directly to L four. 
but this is a very technical question also and, and, and a business question. But just from a more lawyer's or legal perspective, it creates a lot of challenges and it creates exactly this issue of uh, who is responsible in, in, in the case of a crash. Paul Patrick, I'm sorry, I think we're going to run out of time before I can get to any more questions. Sure. So thank you very much. That was really enlightening. Um, next up, Peter Campbell is going to be back. He's talking to Stephanie Vox from thank VW you. about how car makers are going to work with startups. That's going to be at 10 past two. So be sure to join him then. Patrick, thank you very much.